Our text for this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 18. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts be ever pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. So something which has become a regular part of most Americans' lives is social media. Whether it's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, X, formerly known as Twitter, many of them use to keep up with friends, sell on their marketplace, share opinions, or maybe discuss hot topics. Now, I personally have a few social media accounts, but in all honesty, I don't go on social media very much. If you were to follow me on Instagram, you'd notice how my profile page is completely empty. Or if you were to go on my Facebook profile, you'd find how my posts are at least a year apart. It's just not that important to me. But there was a time, there was a time when I went on social media a lot. It was my priority. It was the thing that I cared most about because there I had a platform to share all my thoughts and opinions on the things that were important to me. And there I could find the same for others. There I could learn more about people's perspectives on hot topics. But of all the posts that have ever crossed my computer or phone screen, never once have I encountered a Twitter post which said something like this. Concerning the land of Israel, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Kind of seems odd, but apparently, had Twitter existed 2,600 years ago, this would have been a saying that would have been posted all over the place. This is what all of Israel was saying when they were cast into exile. And apparently, everybody knew what it meant. So what does it mean? Well, in my research, I found that scholars are a little divided on its interpretation. However, they all get the gist of what it is implying. In a sense... Israel is blaming their parents for the exile, not themselves, their parents. So if we were then to give a 21st century translation of this post, it would probably say something like this. Mom and dad, this is your fault. I didn't do anything to deserve imprisonment. Now I'm a slave in Babylon. Thanks for being a great example. Hashtag victim. Hashtag thanks, no thanks. Now, of course, neither of these posts are real. I found a nice little image generator online. But it reminds me of many real posts I have encountered on social media. Because when I read between the lines on these posts, I'm seeing a desire that every human being has. I see the desire to be justified. The desire to be innocent. You see, we desire to be justified in the eyes of others. We don't like being guilty. In fact, some people dislike being guilty so much that they will, go to, they will find any reason to prove their innocence. And one of the easiest ways is what Judah did. You blame it on someone else. Here is another example, probably a more contemporary example. Seriously, a $400 ticket. The guy next to me was going way faster. Hashtag injustice. Hashtag corruption. Because, you know, speeding is the police's fault as well as the faster speeder. You know, sometimes the blame on others seems a little more reasonable. Maybe it's, ugh, you know what, I'm sorry I'm late. I got stuck behind this really slow driver. Or maybe the blame has nothing to do with others. Sorry the dishes didn't get done again, honey. I just got busy with other things. You see, it doesn't matter the reason that's given. It matters that we are justified in the eyes of others. It matters that we are right. And the reason it matters is because of right relationships. On the one hand, we desire to be justified in the eyes of others, but also we desire a right relationship with others. You see, when God created Adam and Eve, he designed their relationship to be literally perfect, that nothing in between them would be hidden, that no sin could create a rift in their love, in their trust, in their communication with each other. And as long as they are right, the relationship is right. Judah, of course, was no stranger to this desire. They desired that right relationship with everyone they thought important. Their families, their friends, their co-workers, their neighbors, their authorities, kind of like us. We're really not that much different. But if we look through the story of Judah up to this point, 
I think we're going to find plenty of examples of broken relationships. Examples of adultery, of theft, of murder of the innocent. And this is all between other Jews, mind you. And God, as he continually calls them out on these things throughout generations, they don't always repent. They go right back to it. And then Judah will continue in their wickedness and their relationships further fracture. In fact, their lack of repentance probably indicates their ongoing desire to be right in their own eyes, to justify those sinful actions and perpetuate those broken relationships. But it finally came to a point, a point where God was no longer going to tolerate their injustice. Now, you would think that after losing your city, being forced into slavery and sent to a foreign land, you might wake up and you might realize how the exile is actually your fault. (laughs) No. Judah was so blind to their sin and they were so content in their self-righteousness at this point that they couldn't imagine this being their fault. They couldn't imagine it. Well, nevertheless, after losing everything, they still felt a need to blame someone else. Since it wasn't their fault, it had to be their parents. It had to be their ancestors. It had to be, or maybe, maybe it was also the one who let them go into exile. What if it's God's fault? In Ezekiel 18, 25, he quotes Judah saying that the way of the Lord is not just. God is not just. Now, that's pretty bold for Judah to accuse God of being unjust. I doubt anyone would ever verbally say those things. But here's the truth. Anytime we blame our sin on others, we are also blaming God. If we are seeking to justify ourselves in sin, then we are trying to be righteous on our own terms. God's righteousness isn't good enough. We're just, but God isn't, and he can't be. So this leads us then to point number three. As humans, what we ultimately desire is a right relationship with God. We desire a right relationship with God. You see, the perfect relationship God designed for Adam and Eve meant to reflect a perfect relationship with their creator. And had Judah let go, had they repented of that self-righteousness, which Ezekiel called them to do, had they sought that forgiveness with God and one another, then they could have healed that broken relationship. Only then could their broken relationships, not just with God, but with each other, heal. And hey, maybe they wouldn't have been in Babylon. But you know, as I look at these three bullet points, at these three desires, I don't think humans have changed much. I believe we share these desires. I think we want to be justified in, uh, in our own eyes and others' eyes. We want that right relationship with others. We want that right relationship with God. But like Israel, we try and attain these right relationships by first pursuing self-righteousness. We prioritize that. So when we wrong others, we have that temptation to first try and prove to them through excuses and misdirects that we are right and they are wrong and they should be apologizing to us and that's going to fix the relationship. Yes, I was speeding, but you should have pulled the guy over that was faster. Yes, I said something nasty, but he did it first. No, I don't talk to him anymore, but he's the one who needs to apologize. Doesn't really fix the relationship too much, does it? Humans haven't changed much since Ezekiel's time. And they were no different in Jesus' day. Looking at God in the eye, many called him a blasphemer. They put him to the test against their own traditions of hand washing, eating on the Sabbath, all the things that Pharisees said not to do. They accused him even of having a demon. And they tested him on the cross by challenging him to come off it if he was truly the Messiah. Jesus was actually right, though. He was the only person who was. And yet, through a perfect, godlike humility, Jesus allowed all of these self righteous Jews to persecute him, to arrest him, to try him, to have him flogged, and ultimately killed. Jesus knew he was right. He knew that everyone else wasn't, but he also knew how that unrighteous centurion would not confess him to be the Christ unless he died. 
He also knew that Peter, James, John, and the other disciples would never be free of their sin unless he died. And he also knew that we would be stuck in our own self-righteousness, our own broken hearts, and we wouldn't be much different than Judah was in Ezekiel's day had he not died. Because through the cross, Jesus shows us a literal, perfect humility. And through that humility, he restored that relationship to the Father, not because of our righteousness, it's because of his righteousness. God calls Israel to repent. He calls them to repent that they would receive a new heart and a new spirit. And as those who have been crucified with Christ, as those who have been brought to new life in baptism, God has put that new heart on us. And as he continues to work that new heart in us, he is also working his Holy Spirit in us. His Spirit who is constantly renewing that heart. And it's amazing what happens. As God grows that heart, he is also growing that Christ-like humility in us. You see, when we have Christ... We don't need to worry about that first part. We don't need to be worried about being justified in the eyes of others because we already have a right relationship with God. So we don't need to prioritize our own self-righteousness. That's already figured out. What having that Christ-like heart enables us to do is it enables us to first pursue that right relationship with someone else. It allows us to be honest with our shortcomings, with our sins. It allows us to accept that $400 traffic ticket as our fault. It allows us to recognize that we didn't stand by what we said. Yes, I should have done the dishes and I'm sorry. No excuse. It allows us to be honest. Because you see, when we show that humility, that's where other people see Christ in us. It's so hard for other people to see Jesus if we are pursuing our own righteousness and justifying our sin. I don't know what your relationships all look like right now. I don't know if there's a fractured relationship because of this self-righteousness, because of this struggle. And so I invite you to consider in your own lives, who are those people who need that Christ-like humility from you right now? Who are those people that need to see Christ in you? Who is God calling you to restore that relationship with? That his Christ-like heart might even be in them. Well, we can be confident that despite any broken relationship that will remain, our relationship with Jesus does not change because that's the one that matters. And as we keep our eyes on Christ, we are enabled to keep our heart on all those other people, all of those broken relationships, and continually pray that God's heart would fill them. You are justified in Christ. You have that right relationship with God. So go pursue that Christ-like humility. Amen.